Good evening. Welcome. Don't we have beautiful weather for tonight? My name is Gwendolyn Mayer, and I'm the archivist here. Many of you already know that. I want to say a couple of things at the beginning, most of which you probably know. We are very thankful to have a new owner for the Learned Owl, and we're very thankful for the Learned Owl. So let's give a big round of applause to Kate and the Learned Owl. We're very thankful for the weather. I already said that. Tracy is going to make a couple of appearances here in the community, so hopefully if you uh, have the opportunity, you might be able to see her at other venues. She'll be in and out of town a little, too. Um, She'll tell you more about that than I need to. I want to mention, and all of you already know this, we're a public library supported by your tax dollars. Thank you. And because of that, sometimes um, it makes things a little challenging to be fiscally responsible. So when it comes to programming, if you want to help, if you have contributions or would like to donate so that we can attract other wonderful speakers, there's a box back there in the corner. All of you can turn around and look. It's by the door. Um, Feel free to put in as much or as little as you like. And if you don't have any extra change or bills, that's okay too. We still love you and hopefully you still love us. And just remember, public libraries are one of the greatest assets around. And I hope you continue to support yours in any and all ways. If you have wonderful ideas and, or you would like us to see, see, do, see us do other programming, please let us know. We're more than happy to take your suggestions and run with them. Now, I want to talk to you about history ever so briefly. Forgive me. Me and my microphone don't get along well. I recently saw a bumper sticker that said, History Matters. And I believe in this community, History Matters. In the 1830s, when Hudson had this terrific disagreement over the issues of abolitionism, colonization, and anti-slavery, it certainly mattered to the, to the fugitive slaves that were hidden in this community. And it amazes me that some 200 years later, this lady came to our community and put it in one of her books because of our history. Certainly, history was very important to the people of the past, and I hope it's as important to you today. But I also want you to think about the future, because people who write about our community and tell the world about our community and its struggles in the 1830s tell future generations about our history, and hopefully it will cause future generations to appreciate what has come before them. So, without further ado, I want to tell you about this wonderful woman. I have known her now for the last couple of years via via email, and she has been in Hudson once before. Um, She is a wonderful, dynamic author. Many of you have read her other books. She's written numerous books, all of which are wonderful. I can honestly say I've I've read them all, unless you've written something I haven't read. (laughs) She happens to love this state almost as much as I do. Um, She is well-traveled throughout the state, and she will continue to travel throughout the state because I know a significant part of her next book is also set in Ohio. But I'll let her tell you about that. So without further ado, the lady you've all come to hear speak this evening, Miss Tracy Chevalier. Thank you. It's, um, It's a pleasure to be back. Um, I remember being in this room in 2010, and I don't know, is anybody in the audience here, were you there in 2010? Well, I'm going to try very hard not to repeat myself. So if I do, um, be polite and don't tell me that I have. Um, I've really come to Hudson, come back to Hudson, to say sorry. I'm really sorry that I did not base the majority of The Last Runaway in Hudson. Gwen tried really hard, but it didn't (laughs) quite work. Let me tell you a little about how I came up with the idea for the book. Um, In 2009, I was visiting my old alma mater, Oberlin College, and I was there, um, and I probably did tell you about this the last time. Um, I was there uh, for various reasons, but I also saw the novelist Toni Morrison unveil a bench by the road, which is commemorating 
Oberlin as a very important stop on the Underground Railroad. And uh, it gave me the idea at the time that I would finally set a book in the States, because all of my books have been set in Europe, and I would write about the Underground Railroad, because it's a, it's a, a movement of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, which is just what I like to write about. And um, not long after I, uh, I decided that, I had this email from Gwen Mayer, archivist of Hudson Library. And she said, you know, if you're going to write about the Underground Railroad, you really should come to Hudson, because it has an amazing history, not just John Brown, but lots of other important abolitionist movement here, Underground Railroad uh, history. So come to Hudson. And she was so persuasive that I said, OK, I'll come. And she said, and by the way, I want you to do a reading at the library for your last <laughs> book. And the thing about Gwen is you don't really say no to her. She's a, she's a force, and you are very lucky to have her, very lucky. And very lucky to have this gorgeous library. That circular room right now with the light in it is just so wonderful. If I lived here, I'd be there all the time. Um, so Gwen, as I said, Gwen worked very hard. She provided me lots and lots of information. I don't know if Alex is here, but when I was here in 2010, poor Alex had to photocopy uh, Xerox about that much stuff for me to take away. And um, I spent a long time reading through all of it, going into Hudson's history. Uh, fascinating place. In the end, I did not set the book here. Um, I was also thinking of setting the book in Oberlin, um, because Oberlin also has an amazing, strong history. But sometimes strong histories drive away novelists, because um, the history of Hudson and the history of Oberlin is so, uh, so rich that it's, it makes a great nonfiction book. But for novelists, there's no room in there. So I decided I would have to make up a community. And the majority, well, actually, uh, the majority of the book takes place in a, a fictional community called Faithwell, a Quaker community I made up that's just outside of Oberlin. And some of the action takes place in Wellington. Is anybody here from Wellington? Don't tell them I'm about to say this then. <laughs> Wellington is not so interesting as Hudson and Oberlin. <laughs> So it's a lot easier to imprint. Now, there was the Oberlin Wellington rescue, so there is definitely information there. There's definitely stuff going on, but it's not quite as strong as Hudson and Oberlin. So I kind of gravitated there. And I have to tell you, the first draft of this book, Hudson did figure in a bit more. Um, and uh, because of a particular character I'm going to talk about in a little while, um, but after a while, I realized I needed the action of most of the book to take place closer to Faithwell, closer to Oberlin. And so I moved from Hudson to Wellington. However, I didn't move it entirely. And I'm going to read. Tonight, I've chosen special sections for you because you're from Hudson. I thought I'd read the, the bits that are about Hudson or have been inspired by Hudson. Um, what I want to do first is tell you a little bit about the heroine of this book. Now, it's set in the States, but the heroine is English. She's an English Quaker who emigrates to Ohio in 1850. She comes here because her sister is much more adventurous and decides to marry a man in Faithwell, Ohio, and make her life here. And honor goes with her. Uh, unfortunately, and it's not giving much away to say that um, 10 pages into the book, her sister dies and leaves Honor stranded here. Honor is quite timid, quite quiet, um, and is stranded in Ohio because she had such a terrible crossing. There's no way she's going to go back across the Atlantic. It would kill her. So she has to go on. And uh, she's stranded in Hudson. Her sister dies and is buried here. So I'm going to read a scene where she first... She's in Hudson and needs to make her way to Faithwell. And she has to rely on the kindness of strangers. And um, this is the kindness of Hudson. And a little bit out. And maybe you'll recognize some of the journey that I took by car and Honor takes by wagon. 
It still surprised Honor that she had to rely so completely on strangers to shelter her, feed her, bring her from place to place, even bury her dead. She had not traveled much in England. Apart from short trips to neighboring villages, she had only been to Exeter and once to Bristol when her father had business there. She was used to knowing most people she came in contact with and not having to introduce or explain herself. She was not a great talker, preferring silence, as it gave her the opportunity to notice things and to think. Her sister Grace had been the lively, chattering member of the family, often speaking so that Honor did not have to herself. Now, without her sister, Honor was forced to talk more, to describe her circumstances over and over to the various strangers who took charge of her when the coach first dumped the Brights at the Mansion House Hotel in Hudson. Once Grace was buried, Honor did not know if she should send word to Adam Cox and wait for him or find another way to Faithwell herself. She discovered, however, that Americans were practical, resourceful people, and the innkeeper had already found her a lift. An elderly man called Thomas was visiting Hudson and offered to take Honor with him in his wagon on his way back to Wellington. From there, she could find someone to drive her to Faithwell. They set out from Hudson when it was still dark. Thomas seemed to prefer silence as much as Honor did. He asked no questions, and for the first time since reaching land in America, she was able to sit and look about without other passengers or the worry over her sister to distract her. Though they drove into darkness, soon the sun rose behind them, tinting the surrounding woods in a soft light. Birdsong intensified until it became a frenetic chatter, most of the sounds unfamiliar to her. She was startled by the vivid plumage, in particular a tufted scarlet bird with a black face and a bluebird with black and white striped wings, their raucous screams scattering smaller, duller birds. She wanted to ask what they were but did not like to, to disturb Thomas. Her companion sat so still that she would have thought he was asleep, except that every few miles he stamped his foot twice and shook the reins, seeming to remind the fat gray mare pulling them that he was there. The horse was not fast, but she was steady. They were on a much smaller road than any honor had ridden along in the stagecoaches through New Jersey and Pennsylvania. There, she and her sister had followed well-traveled routes, where the roads were wide and sprinkled with houses and towns, as well as inns for changing horses and for eating and sleeping. Here, it was more a track of dry, rutted mud cutting through dense trees. There were few houses or clearings or anything other than woods. After several miles of driving through the same wood forest without any sign of people nearby, Honor began to wonder why such a road existed. Most roads where she was from had a clear destination. Here, the destination was much farther away and less obvious. But she mustn't compare Ohio to England. It did not help. Occasionally, they passed a house carved out of the woods alongside the road, and Honor found herself letting out a breath, then taking in another and holding it as the woods closed in on them once more. Not that the houses were much in themselves, hardly more than log cabins, many of them, surrounded by stumps. Sometimes a boy was outside chopping wood, or a woman was hanging out a quilt to air it, or a girl was hoeing a vegetable patch. They stared as Thomas and Honor passed and did not respond to Thomas's raised hand. He did not seem to mind. An hour into the journey, they descended a shallow valley to a bridge crossing a river. The Cuyahoga, Thomas murmured, Indian name. Honor was not listening, however, nor looking into the river. Instead, she was staring above her, for the straight wooden bridge they jumped, rumbled across had a roof. Thomas must have noticed her bewilderment. Covered bridge, he said. You've not seen one before. Honor shook her head. Keeps the snow off and the bridge from freezing. The bridges crossing streams and rivers from her childhood were stone and humped. Honor had not thought that something as fundamental as a bridge could be so different in America. They stopped after a few hours to give the horse water and oats and to eat the cold corn mush Ohioans liked for breakfast. Afterwards, Thomas disappeared into the woods. 
While he was gone, Honor stood by the wagon and studied the trees on the other side of the track. They, too, were unfamiliar. Even trees like oaks and chestnuts she knew from before seemed different. The oak leaves more pointed and less curly, the chestnut leaves not in the fanned cluster she was accustomed to. The undergrowth looked foreign, dense and primitive, designed, designed to keep people out. On his return, Thomas nodded at the woods. You'll want relief. I, Honor had been about to protest, but something in his manner made it clear she should obey him. Besides, she could not admit she was frightened of Ohio woods. She would have to get used to them at some point. She stepped off the track and into the trees, placing each foot with care onto dead leaves, mossy rocks, and fallen branches. All around, there was a raw, earthy smell of ferns and decay. Rustling, too, which Honor tried to ignore, reasoning that the noises must be made by mice or squirrels or the small brown rodents with furry tails and black and white stripes down her, their backs, she had learned were called chipmunks. She had heard that the woods were home to wolves, panthers, porcupines, skunks, possums, raccoons, and other animals that did not exist in England. Most she would not recognize even if she saw them. She could only hope that none was in this patch of forest on this particular morning. When she was 30 feet or so from the road, Honor took a deep breath and forced herself to turn around so that she was facing the wagon, her back to the endless ranks of trees potentially hiding animals. Finding a place where she was shielded from Thomas, she lifted her skirts and squatted. Apart from the wind rustling the leaves and the birds singing, it was quiet. Honor heard Thomas open the hinged seat they had been sitting on, where there must be storage space. She heard his low voice, probably talking to the horse, reassuring it, as she herself needed reassurance that wolves and panthers were not hovering. Honor stood and rearranged her skirts. She could not relieve herself. Being so exposed in the woods made her too tense. She looked around. This is as far from home as I can be, she thought, and I am alone. She shuddered and ran back to the safety of the wagon. Now, that's a, an account of... A, a for, an immigrant coming to America. So many people have done that before. And as I was writing it, I often thought about myself because I live in England now. I have done for 20-something years. And when I moved over, I also noticed that the animals seemed different. For one thing, there are, squir there are fewer squirrels in England, and everybody points them out. So they'll go, ooh, look, a squirrel. And I'm like, yeah, what is it? A squirrel, what the big deal? <laughs> But if an English person comes here and sees a raccoon, they go totally crazy over it. And uh, they've never seen possums. Um, in fact, I've, I was just saying to someone earlier, I, I'm amazed at how much the w wildlife encroaches on, even in Hudson, or I was just recently in um, Bethesda, Maryland, in a suburb of Washington, and it's amazing how much wildlife you have, even a really built up area. And that's not the case in, in England. Um, there's much more of a split. And so there are a lot of things like that. When I first moved to England, I, th I realized I stepped out of the taxi for the first time, and I looked up, and the sun was in a different place in the sky. And it smelled different. The, the, taxi, the fumes from the diesel of the taxi smell different from diesel fumes here. I don't know why, but they do. All sorts of things like that. The water uh, tastes different. If you make a cup of tea, in this country, even with the same tea bags, it tastes different from tea in England. And all of those, are, all of those um, sensory perceptions are something that an, uh, somebody who moves to a new country, particularly in the 19th century, if you're from a small domesticated country and you come to the huge wilderness that was Ohio at the time, it's a real shock to the senses. Now, you might have recognized going through Peninsula. That was the way I went in that way. Um, eventually, Honor gets to Wellington, and uh, she has another little hop to make be to get to, to Faithwell. But in Wellington, Thomas leaves her with a woman named Belle Mills, who's a milliner. Um, now, she, Belle Mills is one of the other remnants of Hudson history that I put into this book. Um, when Gwen gave me this huge stack of stuff to read, one of the things I, I was looking through old um, lists of all of the old uh, shops there were in the mid-19th century on Main Street in Hudson. 
and one of them uh, listed Bell Mills Milliner. And uh, I just immediately took to the name. I really like names. Um, and Bell Mills just seemed like a really sassy Hudson name. And, <laughs> and a milliner. It was just perfect. So in the first draft, Honor actually comes, uh, uh, her sister dies somewhere further east, and she comes to Hudson and stays with Bell Mills for a few days and then goes on. And Bell doesn't have a very big part in the first draft. But as I was finishing that draft, I had had such a great time writing Belle that I thought, I, I need her. Not only do I need her, my main character, Honor, really needs her. She needs some of that sass to help her. And so I made the very difficult decision to move Belle and her millinery from Hudson to Wellington so that Belle can actually physically be nearer, because Wellington is only seven miles from Faithwell. And so uh, that's why I, I, cho I thought, I want to keep a little bit of Hudson. So um, Honor's sister dies here. And then she moves on, and she goes to stay with Belle Mills. And I thought I'd read two scenes um, of Belle, because she's so, um, she is so distinctive. And I tend to see her as from Hudson anyway, even though she's She's actually from Kentucky. Um, and I'm going to attempt to do a Kentucky accent, which is pretty embarrassing, actually. In England, if I do it, they all think it sounds great. Um, but actually, it sort of sounds like I'm traveling around. It might start out in Kentucky, and then it moves to Virginia. Maybe it goes over to Texas for a bit, and, and then down to Florida. So you can have a good laugh. And the other thing is that I can't do an English accent at all. So um, my accents will be fun. Um, this is a scene where uh, Honor is staying with Belle. And the one, of the one of Honor's main skills is she's an excellent seamstress, and she makes quilts. Are there any quilters in the audience? Yes, there's always a few. So am I. I learned how to make quilts for this book, and I'm, I'm still doing it. Um, so when Honor stays with Belle, Belle says, oh, well, you sew well. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll show you how to make bonnets. You can help me. And um, Honor sits out on the back porch and sews for a couple of days. And one day, she hears something in the woodpile, and she goes to look in the woodshed that's just attached to the house. And she sees a runaway slave there. And um, she, the next day, she goes to sit out on the porch to, to sew some more. The next day, Belle gave Honor another pile of bonnets to work on. But before she began, she sat for a few minutes, listening. There were no sounds from the woodshed, but Honor could feel that someone was still there. Now that she knew who and could even name and describe him, she felt a little less frightened. After all, it was he who would be frightened of her. Belle had been so matter-of-fact about slaves before, but the idea was still new and shocking to honor. Bridport friends had discussed the shame of slavery, of American slavery, but it had, not, it had, been in, it had merely been indignant words. No one had ever seen a slave in person. Honor was astonished that one was now hiding 15 feet from her. She picked up a gray bonnet, almost plain enough for a Quaker to wear. The lining was a pale primrose yellow, and she was to sew mustard-colored ribbons onto it and add a yellow cord drawstring at the back of the neck to create a small ruff. Though at first Honor was doubtful of the color combination, by the time she'd finished it, she had to acknowledge that the yellow lifted the gray, yet was pale enough not to make the bonnet gaudy, though the ribbon color was more insistent than she would have chosen. Belle had unorthodox taste, but she knew how to use it to good effect. During a lull in the shop, Belle brought out a tin mug of water. Leaning against the railing while Honor drank, she squinted into the yard. There's a snake sunning itself on the lumber, she announced. Copperhead. You got copperheads in England? No? Keep away from them. You don't want to get bit by one, it'll kill you, and it ain't a pretty death either. She disappeared inside and came back out with a shotgun. Without warning, she aimed at the snake and fired. Honor started and squeezed her eyes shut, dropping the mug. When she dared to open them again, she saw the headless body of the snake lying in the grass several feet from the planks. 
There, Belle declared, satisfied. Probably a nest, though. I'll get some boys up the, in there to kill them all. Don't want snakes getting into the woodshed. Honor thought about the man hiding there, almost three days now, cramped in the heat and dark, and hearing the gunshot. She wondered how Bell came to be involved in hiding him. When her ears had stopped ringing, she said, Thee mentioned that Kentucky is a slave state. Did thy family own slaves? Bell regarded her with yellowed eyes, leaning against the porch railing and still holding the shotgun, her dress hanging off her. Our family was too poor to own slaves. That's why my brother's a slave hunter. Poor white people hate Negroes more than anyone. Why? They think coloreds are taking work they should have and driving down the price of it. See, Negroes are valued a lot higher. Plantation owner will pay $1,000 for a colored man, but a poor white man is worth nothing. But thee does not hate them. Bell gave her a small smile. Nah, honey, I don't hate him. Now, the last scene I'm going to read is the next day when um, it's Sunday. And actually, I just wanted to say that's the reason I'm re wearing this shirt is because it's gray and yellow. Yes. Um, I, uh, I based that bonnet on a Believe it or not, a cereal bowl I ate out of when I was a kid, which I still have. It's oval, and the outside is gray, and the inside is this yellow, and is the weirdest color combination, but it kind of works. And um, you know how you have, you, can, you have very few things left from your childhood? And this one is really precious to me, because it has, but it has a, a crack in it, and uh, a little crack, but uh, my sister and I are both worried that it's going to break. So... Um, she lives in France. I live in London. And, and when she comes to visit, only she and I can use that bowl. So it's up in the cupboard on its own shelf. And my husband and son don't dare touch it. Because we, my sister and I figure if one of us breaks it, it's easier to be upset about that. I don't want to be upset to somebody else. I'd rather break it myself. But um, I just thought it was a color combination that suited honor. So you'll see what happens to that bonnet. Despite staying up much of the night with a whiskey bottle, Bell Mills was up early. As they ate breakfast, eggs and ham, along with hominy grits, a thin sort of porridge Bell said she'd grown up with in Kentucky, Honor wondered if the milliner would go to church. But Bell made no move to leave. After clearing up the kitchen, she sat out on the back porch reading the Cleveland Plain Dealer that a customer had left behind the day before. Honor hesitated, then got her Bible out of her trunk and went to join her. Belle glanced over at the, the book in Honor's lap. I don't go to church much myself, she remarked. Me and the minister don't agree on most things, but I'll take you if you want. You got a choice of Congregationalist, Presbyterian, or Methodist. I go for Congregationalists myself, better singers. I heard them from outside. <laughs> There is no need, Honor said. Bell rocked in her chair while Honor opened her Bible, trying to remember what she had last read with her sister on her deathbed in Hudson a lifetime ago. She read a passage here and there, but could not concentrate on the words. Bell was rocking faster. Something I want to know about Quakers, she announced, lowering the newspaper. You sit in silence, don't you? No hymns, no prayers, no preacher to make you think. Why is that? We are listening. For what? For God. Can't you hear God in a sermon or a hymn? It is less distracting in the silence, Honor said. Sustained silence allows one to listen to what is deep inside. We call it waiting in expectation. Don't you just think about what you're having for dinner or what someone said about someone else? I think about the next hat I'm going to make. Honor smiled. Sometimes I think about the quilt I'm working on. It takes time to clear the mind of everyday thoughts. It helps to be with others also waiting and to close one's eyes. She tried to think of words to explain what she felt at meeting. When the mind is clear, one turns inward and sinks into a deep stillness. There is peace there and a strong sense of being held by what we call the inner spirit or the inner light. I have not yet felt that in America. You been to many meetings in America? 
Only one. My sister and I went to a meeting in Philadelphia. It was not the same as England. Ain't silence the same everywhere? There are different kinds of silence. Some are deeper and more productive than others. In Philadelphia, I was distracted and did not find the peace I was looking for that day. I thought Philadelphia Quakers are supposed to be the best there is, top quality Quakers. We do not think like that, but Honor hesitated. She did not like to be critical of friends in front of non-Quakers, but she had started, so she must continue. Arch Street is a big meeting for their many friends in Philadelphia, and when Grace and I entered the room, there were not many benches still free. We sat on one that was, and were asked to move, for they said it was the Negro pew. What's that? For black members. There's colored Quakers? Yes, I had not known there were. None came that day to meeting, and the bench remained empty, even though the other benches grew crowded and uncomfortable. I was surprised that friends would separate black members in that way. So that's what kept you from God that day? Perhaps. Bell grunted. Honor bright, you are one delicate flower. You think just because Quakers say everyone's equal in God's eyes, that means they'll be equal in each other's? Honor bowed her head. Bell shrugged and took up her newspaper again. Anyway, I like me a good hymn. Give me that over silence any day. She began to hum, rocking in time to the simple, repetitive melody. Later, Bell had the neighbor's boys bring down Honor's trunk so that it was ready for Adam Cox's arrival. After dinner, they sat together in the shop to wait for him. Thank you for your help, Bell said as they waited. I'm all caught up now. Won't be so busy again till September when they bring me their winter bonnets for retrimming. I am very grateful to to thee for having me. Belle waved her hand. Honey, that's nothing. Yet funny, normally I don't take to company, but you're all right. You don't talk too much, for one thing. Are all Quakers as quiet as you? My sister was not quiet. Anyway, Belle said after a pause, you can come here any time. Next time I'll show you how to make hats. Now, I got something for you. Bell went behind the counter and took down from a shelf the gray and yellow bonnet Honor had worked on the day before. A new life needs a new bonnet, and this bonnet needs an adventure. When Honor did not take it, Bell pushed it into her hands. It's the least I can do is pay for all that work you did, and it'll suit you. Go on and try it. Honor reluctantly took off her old bonnet. Though she liked the dove gray of the body of the bonnet, she didn't think the yellow rim would suit her. Yet when she looked in the mirror on the wall of the shop, she was startled to discover that Belle was right. The yellow brim was like a soft halo that lit up her face. There you go, Belle remarked, satisfied. You'll go to Faithwell looking smart and maybe just a little more up to date. (laughs) Thank you. Now, I'd be very happy to take questions from the audience now um, about anything, the book or anything else. And I will, um, if you say it loud enough, I'll repeat it afterwards so that everybody can hear it. Yes? Is Wellington a real Ohio town? Faithwell is not. Yeah. Is Wellington a real Ohio town? Are you from Ohio? (laughs) You should. She's from Texas. Did I go, did my accent get a little Texas there for a bit? No. Sorry, Wellington is about um, 10 miles south of Oberlin, and it does exist. And it's a little town, and that's what it is. Yeah. (laughs) Any other questions? Anybody else? Yeah. You mentioned that you um, studied quilting um, to give you a background for the book. Yes. Um, Who taught you, and what do you like about quilting? Um, The question is about quilting, who taught me, and um, What do I like about quilting? Well, I chose uh, quilting for this book because I always like to find something that my characters do with their hands or with their time. So uh, in other books, uh, the last book I wrote is about a fossil hunter. And in order to write about that, I felt I needed to do it myself. 
Um, another book, uh, the women in the book make these bu make buttons, and I learned how to make buttons so that I could describe it. Um, when Girl with a Pearl Earring, when I wrote that, I took a painting class so I'd have a better sense of how Vermeer handled paint. And this book, it seemed quilting uh, just fit perfectly because I was looking for something that women, most women did in the middle of the 19th century and would have done both in England and in America. And although uh, quilting is not as popular in England now as it, as it is in America, at that time it was. And um, I, I also really liked the idea of quilts being um, a kind of witness to a personal history. Um, the thing about quilts is they are made uh, for practical reasons, to be put on a bed to keep you warm. And maybe not now, but certainly back then. And uh, not only everything happens in beds in those days. You were born in a bed at home, and you died in the bed at home. You made your babies there. You were sick there. Um, and all of that history gets literally almost soaked up into the quilt. So the quilts are like a personal history. Not only that, they're often made out of materials from around the house, old dresses, old petticoats, old coats, old blankets. So people, when they look at them, could see, I used to wear that dress for my old dress. And there's something really comforting about that. It's like, it's like really creating your own layers of history. I also love that the, that the um, it's one of the few outlets of creativity women had at that time. And it's incredible how much work they put into them. The, the stitching is amazing. It's not just the, lay, the top, which is the patchwork or the block pieces or the applique, but the stitching, which a lot of people who aren't quilters don't even notice. If you're a quilter, you look. That's the first thing you look at is all the amazingly complicated patterns of stitching made into flowers and feathers and double diamonds and all sorts and really, really evenly stitched. I mean, these women in the 19th century, a lot of them didn't have glasses, they didn't have electricity, and they did the most incredible stitching. And uh, I just thought it was remarkable that they worked so hard to survive, and yet they put aside this little bit of energy to make something really beautiful. Yes? Right. Oh, yes. Um, what I forgot to... I, you asked, how did I learn to quilt? I, um, I went to... I took a quilting class in London for a year, so I learned all the techniques. And then I joined a quilting group that happened to meet locally, which was unusual because there aren't that many of them. But we meet every Monday in each other's houses, and um, over the course of the, of the book... Over the course of about a year, I made a quilt, all by hand, because I don't have a sewing machine. So it's all hand-stitched uh, and hand-quilted. Um, and uh, that really taught me a lot about how to write about it. And, um, and I loved it so much that now I'm starting something else. So uh, even though the book's out, I'm continuing. Now, the question in the back was about, um, there, is a, there was a book that came out several years ago called Hidden in Plain View, in which there is a theory that, uh, that quilts were, were put out, were used as signals on the Underground Railroad, so that if you had... Uh, a quilt with, um, say, a, a bear's paw. Well, a lot of the Bach pieces are in different uh, configurations of squares, triangles, and, um, and, and they called things like shoe fly, flying geese. There are all kinds of different names. And um, there was this theory that if you had put out the, the, the quilt out, hung it out, and it had a bear's, claw on it, bear's paw on it, then that the runaway would see it from the woods and know that they had to follow the bear trail. And uh, the book became a bestseller, and was uh, the, the author went on Oprah, and um, it also like threw a bomb into the quilt historians um, online. And uh, if you go online, you'll discover that most people have discredited the book and the theory, because um, the woman who wrote the book uh, spoke to one woman who told her that her family, of her family history that of quilts, that there were all these symbols that they had used. But it was never um, corroborated anywhere else. There were, there were never, it was all anecdotal, and there were never any other stories by any other families anywhere in the US saying the same thing. Um, and yet she wrote a whole book about it because everybody wants to believe it because it sounds so good. 
It sounds so plausible and fun and kind of like a detective code. You know, people wanted to believe it, and, and so they ran with it. And it's, it's like letting this something out of a bottle you can't get back in. And I, um, I read the book, and I, before I even knew that there, were, um, there was this dispute about it online, I was smelling a rat myself because it just didn't make any sense. And even the author all the way through it sort of says things like, I, you know, I, she couldn't tell me more than that, but I, I really wanted to believe her. And there was a lot of qualification in the book, and I just thought, this is, I just think this is a myth in the making. And it's become rapidly this American myth that people want to believe because people love quilts. They feel very proud about the Underground Railroad, that there was a movement of people doing the right thing during slavery. And um, so that, and this is, I think, part and parcel of that. So my dis I decided right away I was not going to ha get anywhere near it. I just wasn't going to deal with it as an issue. Um, and even though it would have fit into the per book perfectly, I just had to leave it aside. Yes? Yeah, and it was on WCPN with Dee Perry. Boy, she has a great voice. Oof. She has a great voice and very, I mean, she just led me through it. She's great. Thank you. Right. Okay. The question is about the research I did for this book, apart from quilting. Um, what did I do? And I, I read a lot, obviously. But when I came to Ohio, I had gone to Oberlin College um, in the 80s. So I had a sort of memory bank of impressions. But it's very different going from a, a, a going to college. Um, I had no idea I was going to set a book there 20 something years, 30, almost 30 years later, because I'm going to my 30th reunion. 30 years later, I set a book there. Um, I would never have guessed that. So. Uh, when I went back, I spent a lot of time um, driving around little country roads, listening to music, and looking out the window and sniffing the air. I, it sounds strange, and, and nobody, my husband never comes on with me on research trips because nobody does because they would be so bored by what I do. I'd pull over, I'd see a flower, pull over and look at it. I'd get on my flower books, I'd identify it. I'd think, oh, it's July, is this, you know, what, what, where would this be? What other flowers would there be? I'd look for things. I went to, I looked for some forests that would be virginal forests, so I'd get a sense, I'd walk through those. There are a couple of, of reserves I went to where you could, I, I walk through to just get a sense of what the undergrowth is like, what it felt like to have that huge canopy of trees. I just tried to absorb it. And one of my favorite bits of research was um, I, I wanted, um, Honor ends up living on a farm. And I wanted to visit a farm that was run along 19th century lines, which meant there was no electricity, no engines. Well, we're all starting to think, yes, of course, go to an Amish farm. And I was able to go to a farm, an Amish farm, that wasn't a, a tourist attraction or anything. It was a friend of a friend. And he took me, and we went. and. I, I went twice, actually. And in fact, just the other day, I went back to give her a copy of the book to say thank you. And um, each time I went around, looked at all the animals, smelled things. I couldn't take any photos, because the Amish don't want you to, which is fine. It's actually better, because I was forced to really look and just get a sense of walking into the barn. It's a huge barn. It's unbelievable how much hay and straw you need for 20 horses and 14 cows. It was. And, and just getting that sense of it, the smell of hay, the smell of straw, the smell of a pigsty, going into the house where there was no electricity, and the simplicity of it, and the way it was set up, and the pantry that's just rows and rows and rows of jars. It was really a, really a sensory overload. It was fantastic. And that, I just, um, I, I didn't even take many notes afterwards. I just felt it. I felt it. And, what was really wonderful was when I went back there the other day, um, I, I was walking around with them again. And this one of the sons of the, of the family, there were a lot of kids, and they were all busy working. And the one son who was probably about six, he was busy um, mucking out hay and all, uh, mucking out straw. And he, um, he was quite curious about me. And we ended up having a chat about kittens and colts and all sorts of things. And, he was just so open and curious and big, 
bright brown eyes, and he was, he was just lovely. He was, and I looked at him, and I thought, oh, I've been looking for you, because my next book has a six-year-old boy in it. <laughs> and I just thought, your name, you don't know it, young man, but your name is Robert Goodenough. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I just, it was so unexpected. And I felt like that's a good day's research for me, just to find the character. And people have often asked me, do you base characters on people you know. I never base them on people I know well, because like people I know well, it all gets in the way. But often, I'll base them on someone I just get a quick five-minute chat with, and, and they're memorable. So that was, uh, that was, that's how I do my research on the ground. Any other questions? If we have time. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to a meeting, and, and what is it? Have you felt the stillness of the mm -hmm. The question is about Quakers and the silence and the intermediate. Yes, I, I, um, I went to a Quaker camp when I was a kid for seven summers. And although our family is not Quaker, we went because it was a great camp. It was, it was the Quaker ideal, ideals of simplicity and, um, and, and respect for self-respect and respect for one another and um, was just wonderful. We had a great time. And every morning, 60 kids sat in silence for six, 15 minutes. And um, you wouldn't think kids could do that, but they can. And it had a really profound effect on me. Um, and although I haven't become a Quaker officially, I, um, I do still like to go to meeting for worship when I can. Um, and I, my sister went on to become a Quaker, and my stepmother. So I've, I've been sort of surrounded by it. And, um, my husband, as it happens, is Jewish, so we've sort of gone down that route. But more and more these days, especially in the last few years, I feel like the world has gotten really noisy, um, both physically, outside. It just seems noisier and noisier. And also, like, mentally, we're, we're just having to have so many opinions and everything. Ah, oh, it's so tiring. I could go on about this, but I won't. It's very, um, it's very exhausting, and I find going to meeting is one of the few places where I can just quiet down and try to sink down inside myself and, and let go. And it's a real, it's like meditation, except you're doing it in a group. And that waiting, waiting in expectation with other people, the, the being there with other people doing it is incredibly powerful. If you think about a minute silence that you have at a baseball game, how strong that silence together is. And that's what it feels like for a whole hour in a Quaker meeting. Yes. Yes. The question, it sounds like I really love the research part, and it's, maybe it's hard for me to stop the research and start writing. That is so true. I, I would happily research um, forever and never, ha and never write. But, but then if I never wrote, I wouldn't have any reason to research. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg. i got to do it. And um, yes, the research is really important to me because it gives me, it fuels me with ideas, with characters, um, with, with sometimes with plot uh, and, and landscape and all sorts of things. But there comes a point eventually when I, I feel full. And um, even though I want to do more, and there's always more to do, I, what happens is I start craving that book or that article that's going to explain the things I still don't understand. And when I realize I'm looking for the book that I'm not going to find, I realize that's when I have to write it. And so... I switch over. But having said that, it's not like one day I stop researching and I start writing and that's it. There's definitely an overlap. So I do a big lot of research at the beginning. And then I start writing. And as I'm writing, questions come up. So for instance, um, when I decided that Bell Mills was going to have a much bigger role in the book, I had to go out and research how hats and bonnets are made. Um, and I, in fact, I visited a milliner in London to, to watch. and. Uh, so that, you know, I often get pulled away from the writing to go off in little directions. But the bulk of the sort of main research I do at the beginning so that I feel comfortable writing about whatever period it is I'm writing about. Yes? Is there any connection between uh, your selection of Bell and her origination, if you will, in Kentucky and Berea College in Oberlin? There was a connection between those two. Maria College? Maria College in Maria, Kentucky. 
Oh, Berea. Uh, no, I didn't. The question is about um, Ohio and Kentucky links, because Bell comes from Kentucky. And um, Berea College, there's a link between Berea and Oberlin. I know there was one between Lane Theological College in Cincinnati and Oberlin, but I didn't realize there was one between Berea. No, I, I chose Kentucky because I'm fascinated by, originally I was going to set the book in southern Ohio, just across the river from Kentucky, because it always surprised me that you could have two states side by side with completely different set of values and just a river uh, d dividing them. And, and actually, I don't think it was as simple as that. I think a lot of, there were, you know, in order for fugitive slaves to, to escape, they had to have help in southern states as well. So there were clearly people living in the south who were also helping runaways, who didn't believe in slavery. And there were people in Ohio who were pro-slavery. There were even people in Oberlin, which is like the most radical place ever, who were pro-slavery, who helped who uh, helped bounty hunters, slave hunters, uh, catch runaway slaves. So that blurring of the boundary, I was really interested in, in that. And unfortunately, for personal reasons, I ended up having to set the book up here uh, where I know because I, I couldn't get down to southern Ohio for, for family emergency. So in a practical way, I ended up having to set it in the Ohio I know. But I am still really fascinated by that, let, that divide between... Kentucky and Ohio. And I think that's why I brought, had Bell Mills come from there, because I wanted to explore that a little. Yes? Well, your research, you were continually researching. Do you write only one book at a time? Mm. Do you do multiple drafts of future books? Or? The question is, when I'm researching a book, do I um, do I do one book at a time, or do I uh, do I research several different books um, and do different drafts? No, I, I do one book at a time. I think my brain would explode if I tried to do two different periods of time, and it would be hard. Um, the ideas, do you keep a, a, like a I journal keep, of ideas? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, not exactly a journal, but I definitely, I usually have the idea for the next book while I'm in the middle, about three quarters of the way through one book. And, and what's hard for me is to try to stop myself from not finishing the book and going on to the next. Um, uh, quilters have a term called UFOs, which are unfinished objects. <laughs> and um, quilters do this all the time. They get like three quarters of the way through, and they start to lag, and they get bored and, or whatever, and they start something else. And um, I think we all do that. It's not just quilters, actually. I think finishing something is one of the hardest things. And, uh, but I, I try to um, stick with one project until it's done. Yeah? We were already teased with the fact that your next book is also in Ohio. What else are you willing to mention about it? <laughs> the question is, um, you've been teased by Gwen about my, my next book being set in Ohio, and what can I tell you about it? It's in a very amorphous state, but I'll, what I'll say is it's about trees and the, our emotional attachment to trees, why we move them from one place to another, because... Um, Sometimes the British would come over to England and bring fruit trees with them because they liked the taste. Um, and there are other stories of trees making this migration. So the book is probably going to be set in both England and America. And um, the part of one section of it is going to be set in Ohio in the Great Black Swamp, which is in the northwest part of Ohio. It was the last part of Ohio to be settled because it was so swampy. In the late 1820s, 1830s, it finally started to be settled. And Johnny Appleseed passed through there. And I'm kind of interested in him, not as a main character, but his effect on, um, on this particular family, the Goodenough family, who I made up, I made up. But James and Hattie Goodenough and their son, Robert, uh, and there's some other kids too. But um, the, 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 the couple war or go to a personal war with each other over apple trees. So that's going to be set in the Black Swamp, but I don't know where yet because I'm going there tomorrow to find <laughs> out. So if anybody, I did this the last time I was here, and you were incredibly helpful. Um, uh, if anybody has any suggestions about where I should go, um, I'm going to go to um, McGee Marsh. I'm going to go to Gull Woods. I'm going uh, some other places uh, to the west of Toledo. 
Gwen probably remembers them better than I do. I have them circled on a map. Um, but if you have any ideas of where I should go, come up and see me afterwards. And to, or actually, if anybody wants to right now, just stand up and tell me, and I'll write it down. No, let's do it afterwards, because you can write it on. But I just need to get a sense. You know, obviously, uh, Ohio is so developed, there's very little of that swamp left. But there are little patches. I need to get the sense of what it would have been like. So there you go. Yes. Yeah, I think that maybe you should. We should talk about that privately because just because you might give it away for everybody. It come up and talk to me afterwards. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to do signing. Yes, sir. Your last last question. The question is: Have I ever thought about writing something? And in the back of my mind, maybe it's been covered by somebody else. Yes, all the time. And in fact, um, when I wrote Girl with a Pearl Earring, before it was published, um, a novel came out called Girl in Hyacinth Blue, which was about a, um, a, a made-up Vermeer, Vermeer painting uh, and how it was, how it was uh, created by him. And um, there was also a novel by Deborah Magak called Tulip Fever, which is also about a painter and his model. All came out at the same time, and I thought, oh, they're never going to, they're not going to pay any attention to me. They've already had the Vermeer novel. But look what happened. It didn't make any difference. Last uh, book, book I wrote, Remarkable Creatures, was about a fossil hunter named Mary Anning. And what do you know? A Canadian author published a novel about her at almost the same time. So it happens all the time, and I just have to hope that um, my take on it is different enough that the, the market can sustain, too. All right. On that note, I will say thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I want to mention that we're going to put Tracy out in the rotunda where she'll sign books and maybe have a moment or two to have a conversation with you. So if you all want to walk out to the rotunda, that'd be wonderful. And if not, you can very quickly say goodbye to her and we'll sneak her out to the rotunda.